Let's carry on with Lecture 3, Part 2b. Here we're going to talk about appreciating the variety of cellular inclusions used by bacteria and archaea from the perspective of their structure and their function, mainly focusing on their function. Cellular inclusions are used by prokaryotic organisms to store energy reserves, to store biosynthetic building blocks, for spatial orientation, and for the purpose of, of, purpose of sequestering um, chemical structures that could be otherwise toxic to the cell. From the point of view of energy reserves, the two best studied energy reserves found in inclusion bodies within uh, bacterial and sometimes archaeal cells are polybeta hydroxybutyric acid, or PHB. Its basic structure is shown here. This is a really interesting molecule. It's a type of lipid, but it falls into a category known as polyester. You're familiar with that probably from clothing. So, uh, or at least from clothing from the 70s. I don't know if folks your age actually wear polyester clothing anymore, but um, uh, scientists are very interested in studying organisms that make PHBs because there is some potential for their application um, in the uh, pursuit to make biodegradable plastics, something we would very much uh, like to be able to have. PHBs are very stable molecules, and that's a structure you need in plastic, but yet there are organisms that can degrade them. A lot of uh, different PHB uh, producing organisms that are, exist, for example, Bacillus megatherium is an organism that uh, makes PHBs. It's a very common endospore producing gram-positive organism abundant in the world around us. Microbes also make glycogen as a form of energy storage. So you may have heard in Bio 110 that that's just what animals make and you know that uh, and we focus there on the difference between animals and plants, but in fact many different bacteria make glycogen and they store it in inclusion bodies as a, as a source of future energy reserves. Um, for example, let me just uh, check my notes here to make sure I get this right, but um, examples of organisms that, uh, that store glycogen, one that's medically relevant is an organism called Corinibacterium. That's the genus name, and the species adjective is diphtheriae. This is a really important pathogen. You can get respiratory or cutaneous diphtheria. The respiratory form can be quite fatal. And all the Corinibacterium store glycogen. Now, it's true that many common non-harmful, non-pathogenic bacteria also store glycogen, so it's a pretty common ability in the bacterial world. So PHB and glycogen are two types of carbon-based energy storage molecules that are stored in inclusion bodies uh, by many bacterial and some archaeal cells. All right, so I said also some building blocks, and I didn't mention earlier, but also chemicals that can play um, a role in cellular energetics are stored as inclusion uh, bodies. So on the top right is a bacterium that has tiny dark granules. You can just barely make them out in here and in here and here's another one here and here and here and so on. So you can see a lot of these inclusion bodies with a light microscope, particularly when you're using phase contrast microscopy. Phosphate is necessary for building nucleic acids and a number of other macromolecules and in the cell. Um, inorganic phosphate or PO4-3- when it is accumulated into granules, it's called volutin, and a lot of different bacteria will do that. So if they encounter conditions where there's high phosphate in the environment, which is somewhat unusual because phosphate in many places is a limiting nutrient, then what they'll do is they'll store it up in granules. Note that when it's in those granules, it is not in aqueous solution. It is essentially in almost dry storage. So it will store it up for future um, uses. And then if it hits a low phosphate, or phosphorus conditions, it can uh, solubilize some of that stored up phosphate and utilize it for cell functions. A lot of photosynthetic bacteria will reduce or will use um, hydrogen sulfide. They're actually oxidizing it. 
okay, to produce elemental sulfur. So they're using it instead of um, water. And uh, they're taking the electrons from hydrogen sulfide, H2S, and they're using them to fix CO2 to convert it into sugars in the environment. That elemental sulfur, S0, can then be stored uh, in an insoluble form in granules. And this is a great picture of a bacterium that's, that's doing that, and there are multiple sulfur granules there. Later, the cell can then, if necessary, convert that elemental sulfur to sulfate and use it for um, a variety of purposes, for example, in building proteins. Those um, sulfur granules, in the case of gram-negatives, are often stored in the periplasm, which is probably why they are so visible um, via light microscopy, because they're quite light and they're, they're, uh, they're stored not quite too deeply inside the cell. One of the really interesting inclusions that, uh, that scientists have discovered in the last few dec decades are inclusions that are referred to as magnetosomes. These are important in helping cells to orient, or at least that's what the common theory is. So magnetite, or Fe3O4, there's the chemical formula there, is a magnetic particle. And um, you will found magnetite stored up, wrapped in membranes, it's membrane bound, and those form structures called magnetosomes. And we think that they help bacteria orient and move towards desirable conditions. For example, many aquatic bacteria seem to have mag magnetosomes, and they will use them to move towards sediment, which would help them both access more nutrients, which are sediment-associated, and also help them move away from oxygen. A lot of the organisms that have magnetosomes are micro aerophilic, meaning that they like um, low oxygen concentrations. There are also many algae. Algae are not bacteria or archaea. They are eukaryotes. A lot of different algae also have magnetosomes, and there are similar particles in the brains of birds that migrate long distance and in some other vertebrates. Gas vesicles are another inclusion that are used for orientation. So gas vesicles hold gas. A lot of different aquatic bacteria and archaea, such as the cyanobacteria, will make gas vesicles. These are really neat inclusion bodies because they are um, an example of what are called microcompartments. Whoops. which means that they're made of, they're protein-based. So it's not a membrane that's making the inclusion body, it's a, it's a protein shell. In the case of these gas vesicles commonly seen in cyanobacteria, that protein is, called, is a kind of protein called GVP protein. They're, they form kind of a spindle-shaped protein tubes. This is a structure, this is a, a group of gas vesicles in a cyanobacterium. The, um, the protein shell is permeable to gases, but it's impermeable to water or solutes. So basically what these things are doing is functioning like, uh, almost like hot air balloons, and you can use them to, you can put more gas in to move cells upwards in the water column, or take gas out to allow them to move lower in the water column. And by doing that, they would allow, that, that ability allows cells to regulate where they are in the water column, which in the case of photosynthetic bacteria, helps them to optimize the wavelength of light entering the cell so that they can make maximal amounts of ATP. So I don't have a specific example of inclusion bodies that pertain to uh, keeping the cell you know, free from toxic effects, but um, basically the, the principle there is that all substances needed by cells must occur within a tolerable aqueous concentration range within the cell. So if you have too much of any kind of material, even if it is a useful material, it will become toxic. The idea that a little goes a long way or that the dose determines the poison. So um, we, what inclusion bodies allow cells to do is to sequester these otherwise potentially useful substances away when they are found at levels exceeding those uh, tolerable or desirable ranges. So this will sometimes happen in the form of inclusion bodies that are wrapped in protein or inclusion bodies that are wrapped in um, membranes.
or it can also happen where in a sort of simpler manner where the, those materials will bind with proteins and simply form aggregates. An example, an example of that is uh, how bacteria deal with having too much heme. Organisms that are uh, pathogenic to humans or other blood-containing creatures um, have to access and use heme as a source of iron. So they have a lot of strategies for accessing heme. Heme, however, because of the redox potential of the iron, can be very toxic. So if there's too much, that's problematic. Different bacteria have a variety of strategies for dealing with that. Many of them will form aggregates, though. They'll bind the heme with the heme binding protein, and it will just hang out in the cell until it's time to actually break the heme down and release the free iron. So now we'll move on to part C of this lecture.